the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, one of uh, whom was called Shephra and the other Puah. When you attend the Hebrew women and see them giving birth, he said, if it's a boy, kill him. But if it's a girl, let her live. However, the midwives were God-fearing women, so they didn't do as the king of Egypt ordered, but let the boys live. Vajomer Melek Mizraim El Mayao Dot Ha Ibriot Asher Shem Ha Hat Shifra Veshe Hashenit Fua Vyomer Biyaled Ken Et Ha Ibroit Ur Ite Al Ha Abnaim Im Ben Hu Vahamiten Otovi Bathi Vihaya Maitre Achem Vaal Dot Et Ha Elohim Veloa Su Kasher Deber Elei Esther 4, 12 through 14. Upon being told what Esther had said, Mordecai asked them, yay, <laughs> asked them to give Esther this answer. Don't suppose that merely because you happen to be in the royal palace, you will escape any more than other Jews. For if you fail to speak up now, relief and deliverance will come to the Jews from a different direction. But you and your father's family will perish. Who knows whether you didn't come into a royal position precisely for such a time as this? Vaya gidu el Mardekai et de Bay Esther. Vayomer Mardekai Hashiv el Esther el Tadim Benafshek el el me hima let be it hamelek me kao ha yahudim. Ki im haresh te harshi ba et hazet veravech. Vihatsala ya mad, the Yahudim, my mikom acher vaed ube, abirto bedu umi yo de im il, et kazo, kazot kiga et el malkuth. Luke chapter 1, 35 through 38. The angel answered her, The Ruach HaKadesh will come over you. The power of uh, Ha Elon will cover you. Therefore, the holy child born to you will be called the Son of God. You have a relative, Elizabeth, who is an old woman, and everyone says she is barren. But she has conceived a son and is six months pregnant. For with God, nothing is impossible. And Miriam said, I am the servant of Adonai. May it happen to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. Vayan Hamlak Vayomer Eleya Ruach Hokodesh Tabor Alak Uk Burat Elyon Tatsel Alaik Alken Kadesh Yamer Liyod Ben Hailohim Vine Elisheba Kiroptek Asher Karua, Akara Gamhi Kara La Death, Ben Bizok Natam Vezela, Hakodesh Hashishi, Kilo Yipel Melohim, Kil Dabar, Vatomer Miriam, Hini Shevhat Yah Yahweh, Hikli Kib Darech Vatse Mitaham Lak. So blessed are you, Yehovah, our God, King of the universe, who gave us the Torah of truth and everlasting life in our midst. And blessed are thou, O Yehovah, the giver of the Torah. Amen. Hey, man, you may be seated. We're such creatures of habit sometimes. Everything throws us if it's not the same. <clears throat> well, when we're looking at this Torah portion, I went a different direction. And um, this is leadership. Lesson number 11, it's taken from Exodus chapter 1, verse 1, through Exodus 6, verse 1. It's Shemot, and it's the beginning of the book of Exodus, the book of names. And when I was looking at this and studying and <clears throat> just deciding which direction to go, uh, of course, this parashat uh, Shemot could be entitled the birth of a leader because it really is about what happened to Moses and where he went and what was going on with him. We see Moses, who is... Adopted by Pharaoh's daughter, growing up as a prince of Egypt. We also see this young man for the first time realizing the implications of his true identity because he knows that he is a Hebrew. He is and knows he is a member of this enslaved and suffering people as we see it in Exodus chapter 2 verse 10. <clears throat> he realizes who he is. Okay, He also intervenes. He also acts. And uh, he, it's truly a mark of a very powerful leader because he intervenes actually three times, twice in Egypt, once in Median, uh, <clears throat> to rescue victims of violence. So we know that he has this very powerful uh, leadership within him that when he sees the downtrodden, he is there. He's there to, 
to make a way where there seems to be no way. But when we look at that, uh, again, it's very important to us. It's very powerful to us. The life of Moses is also our life. We can learn something from him. We can glean something from him. But I want to go a little bit deeper than just the surface, and I want to look kind of beneath a little bit the surface because beneath that surface is another remarkable story that sometimes we don't hear about or sometimes we hear but we kind of, <clears throat> you know, just kind of glance over it. We find the Hebrew people have entered into really an air of bitter persecution. You know, they had their day when they were loved and then the Pharaoh died and another Pharaoh came. And how many know with with sometimes with the transition and the changing of uh, leadership and you didn't have that um, union that you had before, then something begins to happen. Something begins to change. And so we find that they're experiencing some devastation. We find that they're experiencing great despair with uh, paralysis, helplessness and yet glimmers of hope because with Jehovah, there's always glimmers of hope how many know that no matter what you're going through there's always a glimmer of hope amen <clears throat> come on you can count on that he's still on the throne right he's still God and God alone he don't need you to be God he don't need me to be God he's God and God alone and he can do some things that we can't do so in the middle of this devastation in the middle of this despair um, it seems like it's going to paralyze them it seems like they're going to go through the motions of making bricks and building this and being beaten and being persecuted and they seem to be helpless but yet there is a glimmer of hope because in Exodus chapter 1 Verse 11 through 16 says, they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor, and they built <clears throat> for Pharaoh the storage cities of, of Ramses and Pekom. But the more the Egyptians oppressed them, the more they multiplied and expanded. Until the Egyptians came to dread the people of Israel and, and worked them relentlessly, making their lives bitter with hard labor, digging clay, making bricks, all kinds of field work. And in all of this toil, they were shown no mercy. Moreover, the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was called uh, Shifra, the other Puha. When you attend the Hebrew women and see them giving birth, he said, it is a boy, kill him. But if it's a girl, let him live. They continued to expand. They continued to multiply. Listen, that can be a little sermon in itself that no matter what you're going through, don't stop growing. Don't stop multiplying. Keep going. Right? <clears throat> because there's more in you. If you stop at the moment where you think it's over, then you don't grow. But they saw hope. You, listen, they had to see hope to keep multiplying. You know, to, to us, it would be like, I don't want to have any more children in this, in this horrible world. I don't want to give birth to any. You know, let's just, let's just end this right now because I see how it's horrible it's going to be. I don't want my children to live in such horror. But to have children means they had some sort of hope that it would end. That their children had a hope. So this new reality for the Hebrews in Egypt can really be described in one word, and I want to focus on that word, and that is it looks like they are in an impossible situation. But I know someone who can deal with, change things in an impossible situation. I serve someone that is not afraid of the impossible. Are we? Yes. Do we get uh, uh, shattered sometimes? Yes. Do we get paralyzed? Yes. Do we fall in despair? Certainly. But there is hope, a glimmer of hope. The glimmer of hope that in the impossible, there is a God that can do the possible. So here they are in this very impossible situation, an entire nation of slaves however, later on, are going to march out of Egypt's gates to freedom. Come on. They didn't see it then, but it was coming. We know it because we read the book, correct? <clears throat> but that glimmer of hope has allowed that impossible to become possible. And there's many things that had to happen in order for the impossible to become possible. And here's the thing about Jehovah. He uses us to make the impossible possible. Don't go home, lay down, cover your head and say, God, do it. He's like, you want me to do some impossible things? Yes. So then roll up your sleeves. Here we go. Let me use you to do the impossible things. So the story of Exodus teaches us about courage. And <clears throat> that courage isn't something that you are born with, but you grow into. 
which is very exciting for us because no matter where you are at, you can have courage. If you don't think you do, you can have it. If you don't think you can stand up, you will stand up. If you don't think you can make a stand, you can do it. Because it's not something that you're born with. It's something that you grow into. It's something that as you read the word of God and allow the Ruach to move in your life and see him do many things in your life and the impossible become possible, you know that he can use you. You know that he can do something in your life if you just give him your hands and give him your feet and give him your mouth and give him your life. Courage is not the absence of fear, but the triumph over it. The brave man is not he who does not feel afraid, but he who conquers the fear. <clears throat> Sometimes we think, oh, I, I, what I'm feeling, I shouldn't feel. Uh, you, you can feel it as long as it fuels you. Right? We all are afraid from time to time. Correct? There's things that make us, you know, oh, I don't even want to get up today. There's things that we say, I want to go to bed now. So we don't want to get up and we, don't, and we want to go to bed. So that means the, the bedroom is where we want to be. And we're hoping that the next day, but we're afraid even to get up the next day to see if anything's changed. So, you know, we're tempted to stay. And, and, and what we need to understand is <clears throat> that this thing that is called courage is not something that we naturally sometimes have. I'm sure that some people do naturally have it, but it is something that we have to grow into. It is something that we, we read the word of God. It, it causes us to, to buck up our chest and pull back our shoulders and say, okay, I will make, the, I will make this. I, I, I will make through. I will go through this thing. I will make it through. I have courage. So we learn from this Torah portion, this uh, parasha, that courage is contagious. Courage is contagious. You know, this uh, Torah portion <clears throat> is about Moses. So if I was focusing on Moses, I could, I could preach about courage. But I'm not going to focus on Moses the hero. I'm going to focus on something that's underneath the surface, something that you can read and you know that they're there, but they're not something that is elevated. And they are these six heroines, these six courageous women, these six women without whom there would not have been a Moses. So my subtitle, if you caught already, is these qualities of women in leadership. So women, I'm talking to you today. Men, you can listen along because <clears throat> you need to look at your wife and see them as they are and pray for them and encourage them. But we have these six women. So I want to talk about these six women. It's not going to be necessary. Gail hates this. A short sermon. No. It's not necessarily going to be a long sermon, but I, I, I want to just look at them because there's not much known about them. But what is known about them is very, very important. We look at the first woman of courage, the first woman of courage, Yohakaved, the <coughs> wife of Amrad and the mother of Moses. But she's not only the mother of Moses. Do you realize she's the mother of three very powerful leaders? Listen, sometimes we're blessed to have one, two, three, four. Sometimes we're encouraging, but she gives birth, and therefore she has these very powerful, great leaders of the Israelites. They are going to move these people. They're going, they going to bring these people into a greater knowledge of Jehovah. They're going to bring these people into a great nation, into the promised land. They're the, they're the leaders. They, they, they are not perfect. But at the height of Egyptian persecution, this woman, and don't take her for granted, she had the courage to have a child. You don't think that takes courage when you know that your child could die? But she still decides, I'm going to have a child. She not only has that child, but she hides that child for three months. You don't see her trying to escape Egypt, even though that probably would be impossible. You don't see her trying to, to grab a camel or a horse and head on out. She remains where she is, in her station, where God has placed her, in the position where she's at, in the house where she's lived in. She is in that place through this persecution, through this despair, through this helplessness, and she decides still to have a baby. And when she has that baby, she has the power to hide this baby for three months and then has the power to devise a plan. To give him a chance of being rescued. Creates 
an ark, right? Wraps him and puts him in a river. That's strength. That's strength. <clears throat> that's strength as a woman. That's strength as a mother. You don't think, uh, and I'm not a mother, but I'm a father, and I can still feel the same things. That would be hard to know. I'm putting this baby in the river, and I have to trust only one person, and that is God. And I have to trust him even though I'm in despair. I have to trust him. Listen, it's one thing to trust him when you're on a mountaintop, when everything's going good. Oh, yeah, I can trust him because he supplied my need. I can trust him because he healed me. I can trust him because he's been with me. He's never left me nor forsaken me. But when you're in despair, when you're in helplessness, when you're paralyzed, when babies all around you seem to be dying, when things are happening that, that you don't want to happen, and then you still put your baby in a river believing that God, in the midst of all this horror, I believe you're going to do something with him. Her children, listen, didn't become leaders by accident. She had a role to play in it. A woman of courage. <clears throat> Let's look at the second one, Miriam. Her daughter, Moses' sister. Now here's a, a, a daughter, a, a sister who loves her uh, brother so much that she keeps watch over that child as that child goes down the river, hovering, maybe interceding, maybe watching for whatever reason. And she saw that child <clears throat> kind of, you know, come to the, to the Pharaoh's daughter, and now she has the courage to approach Pharaoh's daughter and suggest that he be nursed by his own people. Let me see you approach a Pharaoh's daughter whose father is killing you. Whose father doesn't like you. Uh, maybe we'd step back and say, well, God's got it. But she, <clears throat> she stood up. She went forward. And when we look at Miriam, <clears throat> there's something that the text shows us. And what it shows us is that Miriam has this unusual fearlessness and presence of mind. Maybe some of us would have collapsed in the, the bank and started to pray and <clears throat> cry out to God and God help him, save him, do something, God. We would have maybe been afraid to approach the Pharaoh's daughter. We're not just talking about another sister. We're talking about someone in power. We're talking about someone who's attached to the people <clears throat> who are killing your people. And yet she has this fearlessness that, you know, I might approach her and I might be killed, but it's worth it because I know that God has something that God wants to do with Moses because my mama said, and I believe what my mama said. And I believe in the same God that my mama believes in. So I'm watching my brother. And now I'm not only going to watch him, but I'm going to be fearless. And that I'm going to approach her. And I'm going to approach her and ask her something that maybe she doesn't want to hear. How about we let his people nurse him? So what do we have so far? We have two women. And we find courage. We find fearlessness. And we find presence of mind. Women, <clears throat> you're very courageous. Women are fearless. And women sometimes have a presence of mind that sometimes we don't. Number three and number four. Don't get excited that I have six, but number three and number four, we have the two midwives. Shifra and Pua. In Exodus chapter 117, <clears throat> when we look at what they're what they're doing they are approached by the pharaoh himself and they are told that when a boy child is born kill it where are they living they're living in despair they're living in helplessness they are paralyzed who are they they are two midwives what power do they have nothing you have to understand that this is going to be at the cost of their life to save at least one will be the cost of their life. How many can they save until he catches on? Right? So you have to think, <clears throat> is it worth having my life gone for one uh, boy? Is it worth my life to, to give? And, and then you can start thinking maybe about your own family and your other people. And you, and you kind of retreat and you say, well, you know, they're on their own and I'm on my own. And it's all about survival. But they step forward and every boy child that was born, they did not kill. They allowed them to live. 
when I look at that, I see two women who have a fear of Yehovah rather than a fear of man. What can man do to you? Fear God. They're summoned. They are accused of disobedience. <clears throat> and let's look at Exodus chapter 1, 18 through 21. The king of Egypt summoned the midwives and demanded of them, why have you done this and let the boys live? And the midwives answered Pharaoh, it's because the Hebrew women aren't like the Egyptian women. They go into labor and they get birth before the midwife arrives. And therefore, God prospered the midwives and the people continued to multiply and grow very powerfully. Why? Because they not only of, were courage, they not only were fearless, they not only had a presence of mind, they not only had the fear of Yehovah, they were ingenious. in coming up with a plan that would satisfy Pharaoh. The powerful story shows us the idea that there are moral limits to power. They're letting you know, I will do what my leader wants me to do until it is morally incorrect. Then at the cost of my life, I will obey God rather than man. <clears throat> we have to understand because we're living in the last days and these uh, traits for women, also for men, might come in handy. Might just come in handy for us. At what level will you say no? When will you say I cannot do it? When will you morally be able to stand for your own conviction for the word of God over what people of power want you to do? At maybe even the cost of you or your family. There are instructions that should not be obeyed. There are crimes against humanity that cannot be excused. And what we find in these two midwives, what they teach us, they teach us there is courage and moral belief and conscience over conformity. Be not conformed to this world, but be what? Transformed. By the way, renewing of your mind. And when faced with the opportunity... <clears throat> Do I obey, save my life and save the life of maybe my family and kill these babies that are born? Or do I know what God has said and do I risk my life for even one? And they did it. We have courage. We have fearlessness. We have presence of mind. We have the fear of Yehovah. We have courage and moral belief. We have conscience over conformity. God is speaking to us. This is how Moses is able to live and become a great leader because there were women behind him that allowed his success and his position to come into fruitation. The fifth one, Zipporah, Moses' wife. She's a daughter of a priest. She was nonetheless <clears throat> um, determined to accompany Moses on his mission to Egypt. You know, when God spoke to Moses to come to Egypt, she could have said, that's nice. That's really great. I'm going to stay home with the kids. Right? <clears throat> Let me know how it pans out. Right? She knew who Moses was. She knew that he was going back into danger. She knew that he was going to go back and maybe face persecution, maybe death. Correct? It's not a shock to her. <clears throat> but what does she decide? Where you go? I will go and whatever danger you're going to be involved in. I will I will accompany you. So she accompanies Moses on this mission to Egypt, despite the fact that she had no reason to risk her life on such a dangerous venture. She could be satisfied. It's not like they didn't stay at home sometimes. She could just stay at home and waited for him to come back through around, you know, after getting them out. Pick me up on the way out. I'll take care of the home. But we have something very interesting, and I, and I will have to admit I don't quite <clears throat> get it, understand it, what happened or what's not. I can only speculate. But I want you to see in this Exodus chapter 4, 18 to 20, and then 24 to 26. So Moses left. He returned to his father-in-law, and he said to him, I beg you to let me go and return to my kinsmen in Egypt to see if they are still alive. <clears throat> and uh, yet Rose said to Moses, uh, go in peace. And Adonai said to Moses and Midian, 
Go on back to Egypt, because all the men who wanted to kill you are dead. So Moses took his wife and sons, put them on a donkey, and started out for Egypt. And Moses took God's staff in his hand. And then we have this very strange thing happening in 24. So apparently they're on their way, correct? Mom and the kids. And then it says, <clears throat> at a lodging place on the way. Now, when I look at that, I don't know whether he got to a place, a lodging place, and maybe he was overstaying his stay. Maybe he was rethinking some things. You know how you do. Come to the hotel. It's a little bit nice, a little bit relaxing. So you just thought, well, I'll just, you know, vacation a little bit. But what did God tell him to do? Go. <clears throat> so he's at this lodging place, and Adonai met Moses and would have killed him. Did you all ever see that? I'm going to kill you. Why are you going to kill him? Is he making a decision not to go? Is he, is he wavering in his faith? What, you know, when you have a purpose and a plan and God sends you and then you go and then you don't go and, then, and you go and you stop, is God angry with him? He's going to kill him. And what happens? Zippor does what? Takes a flintstone, cuts off the foreskin of her son. She threw it at his feet saying, what a bloody bridegroom you are for me. But then God let Moses be. She added a bloody bridegroom because of the circumcision. The only thing I can think of <clears throat> is that we have this moment, maybe when there's some confusion, we have this moment when we find that maybe he's not making a decision, maybe he is breaking a covenant, and what does his wife do? Let me remind you of the covenant. Let me remind you who you serve. Let me remind you that you have made a covenant with Yehovah. And you didn't bring me out to a, a, a lounging, lodging place to die and to see you die. We're seeing this through. She is a woman of monumental determination. We're in it. Let's do this thing. Who at a very crucial moment has a better sense than Moses himself of what Jehovah requires. Men, we're good. Women, you're good. But we should be better together. We have women that have courage, women that are fearless, women that have presence of mind, women that fear of Jehovah. They have great faith. They have moral belief. They have conscience over conformity, and they have this monumental determination. See, when you find a wife, you find... A good thing. Just make sure you find the good thing. Right? There's a lot of things out there. Find the good one. And you have to find them because we look at this and we find <clears throat> that God is using these women. So find a woman that has courage. Find a woman that is fearless. Find a woman that has presence of mind who fears Jehovah over anyone else, who has great faith, who has moral belief, who has conscience over conformity, who has monumental determination because what's going to happen is they're, they're going to change you and make you a Moses. They're going to bring you out of a wilderness and bring you into position. Well, the sixth lady is very intriguing, and that is Pharaoh's daughter. What's interesting about Pharaoh's daughter is that she had courage to rescue an Israelite child. What was the children supposed to be that if they were male? Dead. So she has this child. <clears throat> if you present it to your daddy, what's the first instinct that's going to happen? Kill it. If I don't want Israelite sons, why would I want one in my palace for my daughter? Right? Come on, there's a lot of Egyptian children. It's not like there's no other children but this one. So here she is. She has the courage to rescue an Israelite child, bring him up as her own in the very palace where her father was plotting the destruction of his people, the Israelite people. <clears throat> that means she had to carry the weight of what other people were talking about, right? She had to carry the weight. Maybe her father didn't like it, but maybe his love for her over, overcome, but she still has to carry that weight. Maybe daddy might be mad one day. 
right? This is the woman who gave Moses his name. Who is she? She is a gracious woman. She is a woman of faith. She is a woman that the Torah in this portion does not give her a name, but reveals her name in 1 Chronicles chapter 418 and reveals her character. Are you ready to see it? In 1 Chronicles 418, <clears throat> and I, for the sake of butchering, I won't say all those names, but uh, Ezra, Yetzer, uh, Mared, these are the sons of Bityah, the daughter of Pharaoh. Bitya, Batya means what? Daughter of Yehovah. Which kind of gives me an understanding that maybe she, because of who she was around, those midwives, the, the Israelite people, maybe she also believed in a very secret way, not with her father, right? That she's going to be this daughter of Yehoah. She is going to be the one that God has already placed in her a love for him. God has already placed in her. Listen, <clears throat> we know we all come from families that maybe don't even serve God sometimes. And you might have been the one that served God in the very beginning. And you know that sometimes you carry the weight of serving God. And you can be this daughter or son in the midst of a whole family that's not serving Yehovah. She is... Batya or Bitya, the daughter of Yehovah. She is mentioned. And she has a lineage. And one of those lineages is she names Moses. Her relationship with God was greater than her relationship with her father. It had to be. Or you don't take the chance. She had to trust her God. That he <clears throat> was going to take care of her when approached her father with an Israelite child. This mass murderer would have no problem saying, give me that child. Guards, take it and kill it. She also could have hidden that child. The palace, I'm sure, was large. She had a lot of servants that she could have taken me in. <clears throat> but she raised him as her own in the very palace. That's a strong woman. We have courageous women. We have women who are fearless. We have women who have presence of mind. We have women who are fear Yehovah, who have great faith, who have moral belief, who have conscience over conformity, who have monumental determination. And we also have a woman who is willing to risk her own life to raise a child that was not hers. So on the surface, this Torah portion is about the initiation into leadership of one actually remarkable man named Moses. Because as we read Exodus, it's about the exploits of God using Moses in a great and powerful way, right? But beneath the surface is this counter narrative of six extraordinary women without whom there would not have been a Moses. They joined the list of Deborah and Hannah, Esther, Miriam, the mother of Yeshua, Ruth. Do they get all the accolades? Do they get more than maybe a paragraph or a sentence? No but the power of their life and the purpose of their life behind the scenes is great. Listen, women, you might not always get all the accolades. You might not always get all the praise. <clears throat> you know, you might not always get all the pats on the backs by your children or by anyone else, but let me tell you something. You sit here as a powerful woman of Yehovah who has placed you in a position with children who you have, as rough as it can be, as misunderstood as, as it can be, as thankless as it will be, but know this. Your paragraph might be small, but the impact is very large. You might not have a whole book about you. Come on. 
But there's a purpose and a plan that God has for you. And it will be told, maybe not today, it might not even be told <clears throat> tomorrow, uh, it might not be up on a stage and everyone looking, and we, we know we do our best on Mother's Day, we know we do our best with women, but the thing is, behind the scenes, God is using you to do great and mighty things. And yeah, you're looking, well, where's my Moses? Listen, again, I say this all the time, it's not over. The book is not written completely yet. But if you can be that woman of courage, of fearlessness, of presence of mind, who fears a Yehovah, who has great faith in everyday living, who has moral belief and conscience over conformity, who has monumental determination and willing to risk your life. Add your name. Add your name. If women emerge so powerfully as leaders, then why were they excluded in Jewish law for certain leadership roles? You know, as I was studying that and thought, well, this is a good place to stop, but I wanted to go a little further because when we look carefully, we see that women were historically excluded from two areas, and there are three areas. And I just felt that it was important to understand this. The first area that they were excluded was the crown of the priesthood. Because it went to Aaron and his sons. They were excluded from the crown of kingship. Because it was promised to David and his sons. But they were never excluded from the crown of Torah. Never. And as we see, we see <clears throat> great women being used, not only prophets, but prophetesses. Not only prophetesses, but judges. So the crown of priesthood, yes, may not be yours. The crown of kingship, yes, may not be yours, but the crown of Torah is yours. We have these six women. They were leaders, not because of any position that they held. They held no priesthood. They held no kingship. But they were able to teach with their life. They were leaders because they had courage and conscience. They refused to be intimidated by power or even defeated by circumstances. Women, that's you. I want to, I want to encourage you. That is you. Refuse to be intimidated by power and refuse to be defeated by circumstances. You serve a God who's greater. You serve a God that in the midst of despair, <clears throat> a child is born, hide that child, send that child, and God's still watching that child. And in every way, uses women to bring him into a place. God is using you. God is using us. God is using uh, uh, us to bring in and bring forth people that are going to serve him in a great and mighty way. These are the real heroes of the Exodus. Yeah, we do read about Moses. And like and, and we should. He's a great man, great leader. But behind him are women. In this house we have great men, but in this house we have great women. And we have to recognize that. Your purpose, your role, the plan of God in your life. Look at these <clears throat> characteristics of these women and then look at your own life and see where you fit. And maybe you might have to shore some things up and maybe you have them down and, and maybe you have to bring some things in. But this is a mark of women who will do great things. And I'm preaching to women who will do great things. Look at 1 Timothy 2, 8. The, my next slide says... Extra, 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 extra. I want to touch for one moment, and I don't want to take away from the Torah portion, but I, I felt as I was looking at this, I, 
<clears throat> I prepared it in my notes, but I wasn't sure if I was going to say it, but I, I think we just need to say it just for clarification. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, 8 through 15, we see this very powerful scripture that says, Therefore, it is my wish that when men pray, no matter where, they should lift up hands that are holy. They should, become, they should not become angry or get into arguments. Likewise, the women, when they pray, should be dressed modestly and sensibly in respectable attire, not with elaborate hairstyles and gold jewelry or pearls or expensive clothes. Rather, they should adorn themselves with what is appropriate for women who claim to be worshiping God, namely good deeds. Let a woman learn in peace, fully submitted, but I do not permit a woman to teach a man or exercise authority over him. Rather, she is to remain at peace, for Adam was formed first, then Hava, and, and <clears throat> also it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman who, on being deceived, became involved in the transgression. Nevertheless, the woman will be delivered through childbearing, and provide that she continues trusting, loving, and living a holy life with modesty. And everyone said, oh, Lord, now what are we going to talk about? Very quickly, let me say this. In 1 through 7, he talks about the need for men and women to pray. That's how simple that is. Do we not recognize that it's important for each and every one of us to pray? In verses 8 through 10, he gives direction and corrects clothing choices, conduct, and mindsets that are unbecoming as members of the body of the house of Jehovah. What he's saying is, if you're going to pray... When you come to pray, look like you're someone who should be praying, not someone who should be prayed for. It's very simple. Represent who he is. In verses 11 through 15, <clears throat> He writes to a certain group of women, which is what we don't understand, because in the English they continue on talking about women. But he writes to a certain group of women. He establishes a doctrine with respect to appropriate public conduct of wives and husbands in the Kehillah. Now, again, I don't want to be a downer. But he establishes doctrine dealing with this respect, because some men are more passive by nature. Do I have an amen? It's true. And some women are more aggressive by nature. Hello? So what Paul does <clears throat> is in this doctrine, there is a need for those husbands and wife relationships where the dominant and the submissive personalities may be out of balance. He wants to bring them back into balance. Paul does not leave the conduct of wives in the Kehillah up to the personalities of the husband and wife. Paul is calling wives to get back in order regardless of personalities, and he's calling timid husbands to take the lead and be the head. That's what he's doing. I say it because you need to understand these women that I talked about in the Torah portion, they understand this. Paul emphasizes the importance of Jehovah's orders being maintained in the husband and wife's relationship, especially in public. Look at 1 Timothy 2, 11 through 15. Here's what it says in the original language. Let the Isha learn in silence. Not the woman. Let the what? Let the wife learn in silence. Silence and all submission. I do not allow a wife either to have teaching authority over or to have <clears throat> domination, taking control over her man, but to be in silence. And then he talks about Adam was first formed then Hava. Now, don't start reading into what I'm saying. What he's saying is, and we all can acknowledge, it is shameful for a wife to speak out as if she is the family representative. When you're in a marriage. So wives, you have to be quiet. When it comes to representation. Oh, just be quiet. Let me my husband and I. No, 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 no. You're missing the point. The point is, who is the lead? Now, see, it's going to get a little sticky here. Now you're all getting a little sticky. You were excited about not talking about courage and all that. And <clears throat> now it's getting a little muddy, a little sticky. Getting a little thick in the tongue. You're looking for drinks of water, a little candy. 
to speak out in public. Now we have to put it in, the pers in perspective. Here's the thing. <clears throat> They're being taught, one's on one side, one's on the other, and the wives are yelling. And what Paul is saying is, you have someone who represents you. Wait till you get home and ask your representative. That's all. Don't stand up <clears throat> like you're going to represent yourself. The two has become one. And the, because the two has become one, you have chosen him as your head. So he must now represent you. And if your personality is more aggressive than timid and his is more timid than aggressive, he will have a tendency to allow you to represent. But the thing is, you do not represent the head. You have a voice in the head. So if you are in public and you're representing him, you're the representation, you are representing your husband. And it's obvious then that there is out of orderness in your marriage, is what Paul was saying. A husband who is not respected in public by his wife will not be respected by anyone else. The wives who were speaking out in public were acting as if they were single. So what he was saying was if Sister Sharon, <clears throat> who happens to be single, stood up and would like to address, she's more than fine to address because she is her own representative. If a widow wanted to speak up and say something, she's more than welcome to. She's her own representative. It has nothing to do with women being silent. It has everything to do with position and power and who your representative is. Who is your lead? Who is your head? Then let the head lead. If a single woman or a widow speaks out in public, there's no shame to it. But the shame comes. A wife who speaks out disrespects her husband. She is behaving as if she either does not have a husband or does not trust or respect him enough to allow him to represent her. This is what he's saying. You are powerful women. Courage, presence of mind, fear of Yehovah. But there's also a position. And we see it in Sarah. We see it <clears throat> in, in those women uh, when they're, when they're uh, working with and how God blesses them. Their strength. This is not a weakness in women. Do you understand? That's a strength. When you find someone who, is, who can represent you, it is strength to let them represent you. That is strength. To say, he represents me. Not that you don't have a voice. Not that you're speaking because when you go home, you're supposed to ask and talk. And think. But at the end of the day, <clears throat> I represent Gail. And what I do represents Gail. So that puts even a bigger pressure on me because it's not only me I'm representing. I'm representing her. But she has to have courage. Great faith. And who God has placed in her life. Because I don't want to misrepresent her. In Romans chapter 6, 1 through 4. Look what the scripture says. I'm introducing you to our sister Phoebe. She is the what? Shamash of the congregation. Hello. She's a Shamash. So you may welcome her in the Lord as God's people should and give her whatever assistance she may need from you. She has been a big help to many people, including myself. Greetings to Priscilla and Aquila. Naming Priscilla first means that Priscilla has the more prestige. She's the, 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 the more of the leader. My fellow what? Workers for the Messiah Yeshua. They risked their necks to save my life. Not only I thank them, but also all the Messianic communities among the Gentiles. I mean, I could go on and go on. So what I'm saying is the crown of priesthood, no. The crown of kingship, no. The crown of Torah, yes. And what an awesome responsibility that is. To train up a child in the way it should go. To lead <clears throat> men and women to, to, to be able. But when it comes to that position of husband and wife, the husband represents. That's what Paul was saying. So he's not saying women keep silent in the church. What he's saying is, women, you have a representative. No need to cause a ruckus at this moment. Go home and let your representative.
Paul did not prohibit women from teaching or exercising authority over men. He only prohibited women, wives, excuse me, from dominating their husbands. If Paul wanted to assert that women were not allowed to teach or exercise authority in general, he would have never acknowledged in the Kahila, Phoebe, Priscilla, Aquila. And there's other people in that chapter. But he mentions them as instructors in the community. He mentions them as women who have done great things in the work in the kingdom of God. Galatians chapter 3, 24 through 28. According to the Torah function as a custodian until the Messiah came so that we might be declared righteous on the ground of trusting and being faithful. But now that the time for this trusting faithfulness has come, we are no longer under a custodian. For in union with the Messiah, you are all children of God through this trusting faithfulness. Because as many of you as were immersed in the Messiah have clothed yourselves with the Messiah in whom there is neither what? Jew nor Gentile, neither what? Slave nor freeman, neither what? For in union with the Messiah, Yeshua, you are all one. In the eyes of Yeshua, the crown of priesthood is not yours. The crown of kingship is not yours. But the crown of Torah is yours. But when you come into a position of marriage, the husband must represent. I brought it in because sometimes we need a balance, don't we? These are not renegade women. These are women who understand the power of Yehovah. And as great as they are with courage and fearlessness and great faith, and we have the list. They are also those who love Yehovah, follow Yehovah in a very balanced life. Women, there are great qualities within you as leaders. And we are blessed to have you in this house. We are blessed to have you as, as sisters and teachers and those who expound and train and teach, however you do it in whatever capacity you do. Don't think yourself lesser because the big book has not written a lot. It's in the underlining, underneath surfaces of the narrative. It's behind the scenes that you do, women, that maybe is taken for granted, not noticed, not appreciated by sometimes us, right? But nonetheless, so very important. So very powerful, and we so very thank each and every one of you. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Let's stand before Yehovah. <clears throat> Come on, children. Mr. Tammy, you're here. Pray for these children, please. Father God, we just thank you today for the word that has come forth, God, reminding us as women where we stand in you, Father God, and help us as women to be what we need to be for these children that are standing here today that are represented in body or represented and carried in the hearts of women in this place, Father. We thank you that and ask you that you bless each and every one of these children, that you guide them with your hand, that you help them to know and understand their role in society as being your light 
and your example, Father, and the example of your son, Yeshua. Lord, we just thank you that standing here, we do have Rachel's and Rebecca's and Isaac's and Jacob's. Father, we just thank you that in each and every one of these children, there is a seed planted that will grow and be great in your kingdom, Father God. We love you today. We honor you in Yeshua's holy name. Amen. Amen. Lift your hands to receive the priestly blessing. <coughs> Yehovah, he who exists, kneel before you presenting gifts and will guard you with a hedge of protection. And Yehovah, he who exists, will illuminate the wholeness of his being towards you, bringing order, and he will provide you with love, sustenance, and friendship. And Yehovah, he who exists, will lift up wholeness of being and look upon you. He will set in place all you need to be whole and complete. May Yehovah grant all the desires of our hearts, fulfill all our purposes and all our petitions. May Yehovah hear from heaven. Quickly answer all our requests and save us in the day of adversity. And in the name of Yeshua, the Messiah, defend us from our enemies, from poverty and from bondage. Shabbat Shalom.